Good afternoon, everyone. I want to give you a touch of reality. So we all know that uh, SRV6 is going through a great momentum. However, uh, there are networks out there that they will never support SRV6. Some of them, they will not even support SRMPLS. So this presentation is about how to interconnect domains uh, where those domains are, you know, they have different encapsulation options or different transport encapsulation. I'm gonna talk about uh, what an interdomain uh, connectivity is, when to use service gateways. We are gonna talk about some service gateways procedures, how we are standardizing those in the IETF, and some takeaways. So, so in this presentation, throughout this presentation, a domain is gonna be a, like an IGP instance or an autonomous system, or sometimes a superset of both. Suppose you have an operator A and operator B, they merge together, they bring all their network complexities and they have different domains. So you end up with a domain one, which is a SRMPLS based, domain two, maybe traditional LDP, RSVPTE uh, based network. Domain three may be a, a data center where you have VXLAN tunnels. And domain four is a brand new SRV6 uh, domain. So these new uh, merged operator, uh, they need to deploy end-to-end, -end, layer two and layer three services. So the question is, how do you do it? And as usual, the correct answer is, it depends. So we're gonna see three different types of solutions that can actually address the, the problem. And uh, those three solutions can be perfectly valid. It really depends on the requirements that you have. The first group is what we call the transport interworking solution. And in this solution, basically, we're gonna use the same example across the, uh, all the slides. So you have an ingress P1, border router two, border router three, and an egress P. And both ingress and egress PEs, they are attached to the same layer two and layer three VPN services. We're going to focus in this direction, but on the opposite direction, uh, the same thing will happen. So in this option one, Basically, the border routers are not changing the VPN routes at all. They are just providing this transport interworking function. They are stitching SRV6 to uh, other technologies, SRMPLS, for instance. Sometimes they are even encapsulating SRMPLS over SRV6. But the, uh, the key thing here is that they provide that translation layer uh, at the transport level. So in this solution, the ingress and egress uh, P's must be of the same encapsulation. The reason why is because the egress PE4 will advertise this IPVPN or EVPN route, and no one is going to process or change that route along the way. You will have, of course, uh, control plane route reflectors along the way, but no one is touching that uh, route. So the ingress PE will import that route, and they will process and program uh, you know, the FIP accordingly. So the advantages of uh, this solution is that you have no service instantiation on the border routers. You have no VPN state on those routers. But, you know, on the contrary, the, uh, this solution does not allow you to have translation of the VPN routes, uh, route attributes sometimes because you are connecting different domains. You're using, um, you know, in domain one, you're using route target A for customer X and uh, you're using the same route target in domain three for a different customer. That means if you want to extend any of those two customers, you need to provide some route target translation capabilities. So also in this solution, you will have what we call the VPN XOP scale pressure on the ingress PE. So the ingress PE will need to, to learn, uh, you know, all the, uh, the uh, remote uh, uh, next hops that you have in domain three. As mentioned, ingress and egress P's must be of the same encapsulation. And also if you deploy uh, layer two broadcast domains with uh, EVPN, for instance, the uh, BAM ingress replication or the ingress replication of uh, BAM uh, packets at the uh, uh, PE1 is going to be, uh, yeah, you know, 
not very efficient. You need to replicate at the very ingress of the network, even though all the traffic will go through Border Router 2. The second group is what we call the Interdomain Option B solution, and this is inspired by the RFC 4364 Section 10, uh, you know, the inter AES Model B, that was later uh, described for EVPN in uh, RFC 8365 Section 10.2. So in this solution, the border routers will, will, will have actually VPN state. They receive the IP VPN or eVPN routes. They will uh, program a label swap operation and they will re-advertise the route with a different label and different next hop. So typically this solution is uh, supported for MPLS or for SRM PLS only uh, networks, right? And the advantages here are uh, no service instantiation on the border routers. There is no VPN next hop scale pressure on the ingress P. Now the ingress P will only see the next hops of uh, you know, its own local domain. And you can have some translation of route distinguishers and route targets in the border routers. It's not common, but it's uh, technically possible. What are the drawbacks of this solution? There is no translation of uh, other VPN route attributes normally. All the domains are typically of the same encapsulation. For the eVPN case, when you have multi-homing, as documented in the RFC 8365, you will have issues with uh, things like mass withdrawal. The reason why is because the ingress P1 will actually expect MAC routes and AD per EVA routes with the same next up of the AD per ES routes to correlate both things together. But obviously the next hop uh, you know, of the routes um, keeps being changed uh, along the way. So that's uh, hidden by the border routers. Also the BAM ingress application for EVPN layer two multipoint services is not going to be uh, efficient either, right? So you will need to replicate as many copies as needed in the ingress PE1. So you have a third group, which we call the service gateway solution. And you can see here in the board of the routers, the, the actual picture changed. Now we have service instantiation on those border routers. Now they become what we call service gateways. So here the service gateways, they take, they import the eVPN or IPVPN routes, right? They process those routes. They, they program the FIP with uh, max and IP prefixes. They re-advertise or redistribute the routes only those that are strictly needed to be redistributed. They change the encapsulation, they preserve certain attributes and some others and they, they translate. So you have full flexibility. If you look at the advantages here, so there is no restriction in terms of encapsulations or things that you can stitch together. There is no VPN next hop uh, scale pressure on the ingress PE either. You can translate all the VPN route attributes as you please. There's, you can actually recreate the whole thing if you want it. For eVPN multi-homing, you actually create a per domain eVPN multi-homing construct. So you, you actually have Ethernet segments that are, uh, you know, their context is just that domain. So there, there are no Ethernet segments across multiple domains. And the, uh, you, you build kind of a hierarchy for the BAM replication in case of eVPN multi-point uh, multi services, right? So if you have 100 uh, PEs um, in uh, domain three that are attached to the same layer two service as PE1, PE1 will send a single uh, packet. So if, if you receive an ARP uh, request, for instance, from the CNF in this example, P1 will send a single copy to the next border router. Same thing will happen to uh, border router two to border router three, and the border router three can replicate the packet multiple times. But not only that, you can have, have in each domain, you can have a different replication tree, right? The service gateway will actually stitch everything together. The disadvantages, you need to instantiate services on the service gateway. But you may argue that with, with the use of IPVPN and eVPN, uh, some of the, uh, or most of the uh, network parameters you can actually auto-derive. Also the FIB scale, right? For eVPN layer two services, you, you need to install um, MACs in the FIB, also IP prefixes. 
But you also may argue that in some cases you can, uh, the service gateways can actually advertise aggregate routes. Even for layer two in RFC 9014, there's a concept of a default MAC route that you, you may use in some cases. So the, the big question is, uh, when should I use the service gateway model? Well, if you need a full flexibility in the encapsulation or uh, you know, the things that you want to stitch together, if you need full flexibility in the translation of VPN route attributes, or if you have to provide an unrestricted eVPN multi-homing with any uh, of the limitations of the Model B, or even if you need a full you know, bump replication, a full, uh, fully optimized, this is a solution that you should consider. Always assuming that the FIP scale is not an issue, right? And also that the, uh, the workarounds or the, uh, the aggregate routes uh, is something that you can, you can do. So let's see some of the procedures that are working in terms of uh, service gateway connectivity. And uh, I divide this into uh, you know, uh, service gateway procedures for different types of services. And this is also the, uh, the way we are standardizing this in, uh, in the IETF. So for layer three VPN services, meaning IP VPN um, address families, or also eVPN uh, routes type five, this is a type of solution you would deploy, right? So you would have, uh, simplifying the whole thing, let's say you have two domains, domain one is SRMPLS, domain two is SRV6. So you have the uh, egress P is advertised in a route type five, for instance, that is now imported into the IP verbs of the service gateways. We can uh, modify uh, certain attributes. We can preserve some other attributes like the uh, color extended community, right? And we change the encapsulation Another thing that we do is to slap uh, a new attribute that we call the T path or the domain path attribute. This domain path is defined in the uh, EVPN IP VPN interworking draft and provides uh, a solution to avoid uh, loops, control plane loops. The reason why is because when you receive the route from uh, the egress PE4, it gets imported in, for instance, border router two, and gets redistributed into domain one and it will be imported back in border router three. So in order to avoid border router three to re-inject that into domain one, we slap this attribute with the identifier of the source uh, or the original domain. So when border router three sees that the route is actually coming from domain two and it's local to border three, uh, border router three is, uh, border router three is not going to import that route, not going to install that route in, into the FIB. So the D-path becomes really important in these type of uh, interworking scenarios. For VPWS services, the procedures are similar. So uh, at the egress, you will have some P's advertising uh, routes type one, so A deeper EVI routes. And those are the only ones that are going to be redistributed by the service gateways into domain one in this example. If you have multi-homing routes, like uh, AD per ES routes or ES routes, they are actually only processed in the context of uh, their own domain. You're not going to propagate those end-to-end, -end, right? That's another advantage of this model. So the, the, the service gateways in this uh, example, border router two and three, they are actually attached to what we call an interconnect ethernet segment. So they present themselves as a single system to the ingress P1. So ingress P1 can actually do things like aliasing or active backup and have uh, things like a mass withdrawal or typical AVPM multi-homing features. The, um, yeah, this solution is actually uh, quite interesting. Uh, in terms of AVPM multi-homing, yeah, it actually removes all the limitations that we saw in, in the other models. If you want to see uh, specifications for this model, uh, you can see the EVPN VPWS gateway draft. And also, we have this EVPN DPATH draft that uh, talks about the use of DPATH attribute also with uh, the rest of the EVPN routes. For EVPN layer two multipoint services, the procedures are similar. So, we will also define this interconnect Ethernet segment that is defined in the RFC 9014. And with that, 
and similar to the other models, so basically in this model, the service gateways will redistribute only the routes that they, uh, they need to redistribute. So typically only the, uh, the MAC IP routes. So the IMET routes or the uh, inclusive multicast routes, they are again uh, advertised and processed within it, uh, their own domain, right? What you have in the diagram is uh, the way this model handles the uh, BUM replication or the replication for broadcast and known unicast and multicast. So with the other models, the uh, BUM replication was kind of uh, not optimized, but here, since you are really breaking up the domains, on the service gateways, you can stitch any type of uh, replication tree to any type of replication tree. So in the example, for instance, you have domain two, we are using ingress replication. In domain one, we are using point to multipoint tunnels and the service gateways are able to stitch both things together. Also, because uh, border router two and three, they are part of the same interconnected Ethernet segment. When uh, you know, we receive the bump traffic, only the designated forwarder will forward the, the bump traffic to domain two. And because of the AVPN procedures, we will also uh, prevent uh, the other border router from re-injecting the bump traffic back to the domain one. That's all taken care of by the AVPN multi-homing procedures. So with that, basically we've seen that, uh, yeah, typically we, we need to have uh, this interdomain connectivity across you know, different transport encapsulations. So SRV6, VXLAN, SRMPLS, and other uh, MPLS uh, transport technologies will be there for a long time. So we need to provide a solution that is able to interconnect everything and have end-to-end, -end, uh, layer two and layer three services. Depending on your requirements, you may go one solution or the other, but the service gateway solution is the choice if you need full flexibility. And also, we've seen that, that uh, this service gateway uh, solution is being standardized, so we have multiple vendors supporting some of these options. And actually, uh, during the AANTC uh, interop event, we were able to show some multi-vendor interoperability for some of these scenarios. So I would uh, encourage you to, to go to the um, demo booth and see some of the demos about it. And with that, thank you very much.